What's up, guys? GMAC here with a very quick programming note. The episode you're about to hear was recorded very early Wednesday morning, way before the Knicks played the Dallas Mavericks. It was also way before the Hornets played the Miami Heat, in which they sustained even more injuries than James Plowright, my guest today, alludes to. This is a very banged-up Hornets team, and on Thanksgiving, they released their injury report for this game on Friday against the Knicks. And they are as followed. The mellow ball is out on Friday against the Knicks with calf soreness. This is an injury he sustained at the very last play against the Miami Heat on Wednesday. Also out for the Hornets, Miles Bridges with a knee injury. Grant Williams is out for the year with a torn ACL and just had surgery. Uh, Daquan Jeffries, once a Nick, always a Nick. He is out uh, with a hand injury. Nick Richards and Trey Mann and Mark Williams. These are guys that have been out for a while. So this is a very shorthanded skeleton crew that's going to be playing against the Knicks on Friday. Obviously, we do not talk about them when previewing the game, but the rest of the conversation and the state of the Hornets is still relevant. I hope you enjoy it. Obviously, I'm recording this after the fact but i hope you all had a happy thanksgiving i hope you enjoy this episode without further ado here is your pregame pod for the knicks matchup against the charlotte hornets hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the knicks film school pregame show my name is andrew claudio aka gmac and it is time to preview another knicks matchup this time a matinee here in new york a noon start against the Charlotte Hornets here on Black Friday. I should say to those of you in the States watching, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I'm recording this in the past, so it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't, you haven't had a happy Thanksgiving yet, but I'm going to hope that all of you had a happy Thanksgiving by the time you're watching or listening to this. Uh, and hopefully the Knicks are, are aiming for another W. Obviously, I don't know what happened in the Mavericks game at time of recording, so any catastrophic injury or uh, disappointing loss or overwhelming W that might have happened. We will not be commenting on or reacting to, but we're going to talk about this Hornets team that comes in under 500, would not be in the plane at the moment, yet there are still so many fun, exciting things about this team, especially with a hot streak that LaMelo Ball has been on to start the season, averaging 31, 5, and 6 in this young season so far. Uh, and let's talk about this with an expert joining me to talk about the Charlotte Hornets and the start that they've gotten off to this season. My good friend from across the pond where they don't even celebrate Thanksgiving for obvious reasons uh, from the from SI Hornets, uh, James Plowright. James, how are you today, sir? I'm doing great and I'm equally looking forward to a matinee start is a very uh, tip friendly time for me over in England. But uh, yeah, thanks really? for having me on the on the show, Andrew. Of course, of course, it's good to have you. Um, if I can ask for my listeners that may not be well educated uh, on the matter because they they haven't met you yet, how does someone from across the pond um, become a Charlotte Hornets yeah. fan? Uh, this it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. Uh, I I had a friend who played college basketball. It's, he went over and played college basketball in the end. He started a team at our school, and my grandma lives in Montgomery, Alabama, to this day, and I used to see her every summer. <clears throat> and I went and I wanted to buy a basketball jersey. We went to a Reebok store because Reebok were the, the jersey brand at the time, back in like early 2000s. And there were two jerseys, LeBron James, Cleveland Cavaliers, and Adam Morris and Charlotte Bobcats. Oh, wow. <laughs> and okay. I went, well, I, know who Le- I didn't know anything about basketball. I didn't follow basketball at this point. I was 12 years old and I was like, oh, I know LeBron James is. That's boring. Like, this other guy and this other team, they must be good. Cause like, if it's the only other one in the store, it just must be someone I've not heard of. So I picked the Bobcat story, uh, Jersey, the Adam Morrison Jersey. And, uh, yeah, from there it, it snowballed big time to, to me writing about the team and covering the team here for just about past, past decades. So I, that is a fascinating inception or origin story yeah. of, of a fandom. I got to say that Adam Morrison, because yeah. his Jersey was so if, like I'm trying to think of who else at the time would have potentially like I guess JJ that's his draft class you know dra- JJ coming out of Duke that area so there's a world where you would have just like followed JJ around if if his if he I could have been I could have been following anybody um, and I could have even been following the Cavaliers if I wanted I would have a championship if I'd chosen that path so. There you go. There you go. Which I mean, not to I'm not I promise I'm not rubbing it in, but I am well educated on the the drought that the Hornets have lately been in. Um, I my old friend Richie Randall, who used to cover the Hornets uh, for yeah. the Buzzbeat podcast here at got at, at Blue Wire, uh, he he laid it out for me and and kind of put things into perspective that he's been doing content for like four or five years and has never covered a playoff game 
And it was like, oh my gosh, I have all these first world Knicks problems where I'm worried about rotation decisions and Tibbs minutes. And then, you know, you look at a team like the Hornets, and this can kind of get, get us into the podcast where they've been rebuilding pretty much since Kemba. And the, you, you strike gold, in my opinion, with the LaMelo pick being what it is, the Warriors passing on him to so LaMelo Falls. And it's been, in my opinion, mixed results. But I want to get, get your thoughts on this of, of what the last four or five years has been. So if you could tell me, like, the state of the Hornets, like, are, are people enjoying this, this young season? Are people uh, disappointed by the start? They're currently 6-11 and 11 at time of recording. So, like, how, how are the fans treating, treating this season so far? I, I think there is a definitely a mixed point of view from fans. I think there is look there is fatigue in the Charlotte market, both in NBA and also just all sports. You look at the Panthers too, of poor performance, losing seasons, meaningless games, and it's felt that way for quite a few years now. Uh, you know, you referenced the rebuild post Kemba. I think everyone was ready for that. Everyone was ready. It's time to rebuild. It's okay. Like we've had some competitive teams. They weren't great, but they, they were pushing. And then that all got like fast forwarded after the mellow pick, Terry's there. They shouldn't have been the play in two years in a row. They're one of the most exciting young teams in the league. And all of a sudden then injuries hit. And the previous two seasons to this one have just been right off huge injury. They've been right at the top along with the Memphis Grizzlies with the most injured teams in the NBA. And it's not been like sixth or seventh men who've been injured. It's been your key players, Gordon Hayward, LaMelo Ball, your starting center, whether it be Mark Williams, um, Miles Bridges was suspended for an entire year. Basically, it was that the, it's just been one terrible press release after another. And this season, while Lamelo Ball has stayed healthy, and that's obviously a huge reason for optimism, and they've got Brandon Miller, so there are definitely green shoots. The injury issues have not deserted them, and this season again is being heavily impacted. Where you've not really been able to look at the Charlotte Hornets basketball team with all their pieces together and actually make like analysis of what are their strengths and weaknesses for now, two and a half years. And that's, that's painful from an analyst point of view. And just from a fan point of view, wanting to enjoy games, they've just not been good because they're not the talent. So, I mean, you're hitting on where I want to go next with this conversation and it's the, like the direction of the team and how that leads to expectations. You know, like when you're in a rebuild, you want as like the years go by to find the different keepers that are going to be here when you're ready to start competing. Like I can just only speak from, from the Knicks experience. Um, I mean, they went through arguably a two decade rebuild with the, the one peak of Carmelo Anthony coming here and then winning 54 games. But for the large part, the 21st century has been one giant rebuild. Um, and specifically from like the time they drafted Porzingis on in 2015, it was like, okay, who's the next keeper? And for a while, we didn't have a second one to the point where like even Porzingis wasn't a keeper. Like they traded him too. And it was basically they signed Julius Randle, then RJ Barrett gets drafted. I guess maybe the order there is different. Then Quinton, then, then Emmanuel quickly gets drafted. Then Obi Toppin gets drafted. Then, you know, they make a trade for Josh Hart, and then Jalen Brunson comes, and it's one at a time. And you, you see that with the Hornets, at least from my perspective, we're like, okay, you get LaMelo. You already had Miles Bridges in house. And all I'm gonna say is like what he's been on the court has been a a, a a productive piece to a, a starting five um, with, with mixed results as far as how high the yeah. ceiling goes when he's like your third or fourth best player. And then I'm a believer in, in Brandon Miller. So with the expectations for this season, when you came into it, was it like make the plan? Was it, was it um, player development determined? Like what do you view as like a, Maybe not necessarily a disappointing season, but like a, a a satisfying season at the end of the year. What would that look like for you? I mean, yeah, for me, it was all player development. Uh, the Hornets owe a first round pick that's lottery protected to the Spurs, I believe it is now. Mm -hmm. Moved around a few times. So, like being frank, making the playoffs this year would be a disaster. <laughs> like in the long term team building aspects. I know like if you're just a fan who goes to want to watch good basketball every week, it wouldn't be a disaster. But if you're talking about your ultimate goals to win a championship and to be a contending team for years to come, it, it would really undermine the effort there. And everything the new ownership, the new front office has said is like they are not rushing this. They're taking their time. This is like in my head, they've got this like rebuilding plan of when this new practice facility is going to be built for like 2025, 26. 
that's kind of they're lining everything up to almost be like that's the start of this new franchise and that's when we're going to be ready to compete they'll have stadium upgrades a spectrum center they'll have a new practice facility at this point they should have a couple more good draft prospects and their younger players have matured a bit so yeah for me this is very much a development season uh if everything had gone right and they'd stayed healthy i think they could have been a playing team like i don't think they were going to cut out the legs from under this team if they did well but i don't think they went into this the season pushing trying to reach that it was like everything they did in the summer was just draft asset accumulation that's basically all they did apart from sending what one second round pick out to get josh green like that is not telling me anything is win now it is all about just trying to use your flexibility even the trade they did with the knicks right at the start of the season right yeah yeah it was just to get some second round picks right and they sent out draft rights to james Najee, and like that was it um, so they are, they will never say it. The fans are obviously impatient and this probably could be a playing team if they really, really pushed, but they are really focusing this to be another development year. Yeah. I, I forget which fan base I was talking to, like which pregame pod it was that I mentioned this, but the, the advantage you have as a Hornets fan, and in my opinion, is that the East is so bad that you could probably lose 50, 53 games, like win 29 games, which is, you know, what, what a rebuilding team probably should look like. And I think the Pistons fall in this category too, and like the mm-hmm. Nets as well. And that could be the nine seed in this conference. Like you could end up with getting your young guys a sudden death matchup, like a sudden death game if you want to, while still maintaining like top 10 protections or top, like you said, lottery protection uh, on your pick. So that way, I mean, outside of winning both of your playing games and like you said, the disaster of making the playoffs, but that's why I wrestle back and forth with like what that means. Like the, the, the thunder played two playing games before this run that they've been on. And, you know, you look at, we just talked about adding players as the years go by year by year, uh, and how that eventually leads to, you know, a successful contending team. Um, yeah, I just, it, you know, it's mixed. Oh I mean, the Hornet, the Hornets made the play in twice and we know we're not talking about that now. I'd be like, Oh, what incredible experience that was. Right, and right. Look at how that's matured the players. Like, I think sometimes it can mean stuff and sometimes it can mean nothing. And I think every situation is different for, for my opinion. And I wrote about this before the season. There was a very narrow path to success this year for this Hornets team. where like, where they, they show improvement, they show play development, they win more games, but they don't win too many that they kind of hurt their own future. And that's, it's a very narrow tightrope that the GM, Jeff Peterson, is, is having to try and walk. Um, and look, injuries this season might do some of the job for him, right? Like that might have taken out some of the wind in the sails of this Hornets team. Well, so you just said it though, like the expectations are what can determine whether, how you view making the plan where I'm creating the scenario where they're 29 and 53, but they overachieve and are the 10 seed, right? Where win or lose, it was, Oh, you know what? We made it and we're still in the lottery. Great. Whereas those 43 win teams that made the play in under Borrego seemed to me, I don't know if you can speak to this more, more clearly, but like the ceiling of that team was the plane. And Michael Jordan was like, I want to make the plane. Damn it. Like that was the goal. And it ended up setting the team back somewhat. Yeah, th- they were definitely ahead of schedule. I like the GM, which Kupchak even said at the time, like they didn't necessarily expect to be in the position to be a playing team. That they they got, I think, a little bit over their skates on that one, a little bit over their skis, even. Um, I, I don't even know how much the franchise was really pushing for that. I mean, they okay. made like one win now move, which is like signing Montres Harrell for like a second round pick at the trade deadline. Well, Gordon like Hayward would be where I would push back on that. Like get going out and spending the money on on Hayward to bring in a veteran is a move yeah. that says you want to be more competitive than so than not. yes, but that was that was done before they kind of made that surprise leap forward. The ha- Harold was like, okay, we're gonna make the play and we need someone that's add someone. The Hayward move, which I was quite against for this kind of reason, is because it throws you into no man's land, which it did. Um, the reason for that was the idea of it makes the development of Lamelo Ball easier. You have a veteran player who you can play through. It helps develop all of your young players because you have a reliable guy who's, you know, 19, 5, and 4 every single night. And that was some of the theory there. Um, I, I'm kind of against it. And like for the reason that you said, it threw, threw them into no man's land because Gordon Hayward was 
good when healthy for the first two years of his contract and, and then struggled after, which is kind of exactly what I thought was going to happen. Uh, so I, I would say that, yes, I know what you mean, but I don't think they were chasing the play, the play ins with the Gordon Hayward signing. I think they were talking about trying to create a better environment to help players grow their games. I get it. Like having an adult in the room, you know, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. which they didn't have enough of like yeah. over the years. Since you look at James Booknight, Kai Jones, like some of, you know, some of the stories that you hear coming out of the Hornets organization, they didn't have enough adults in the room. And since last trade deadline, when they added Seth Curry, Grant Williams, Trey Mann, like these guys have made huge differences. They had a Taj Gibson in the off season to come in and be that role. They've not had those players to, to give that kind of veteran presence. Cause like Gordon Hayward, is a good player, but he was not a vocal guy. He was not a culture setter. And, and some of these guys they brought in in the last year or so, they've really been brought in for that reason. Taj Gibson, obviously that warms the hearts of every Knicks fan when you mention him. So I believe it's, so. It's, it's good. Uh, will we see Taj play in this game? Like how, what is yeah. he getting rotation minutes? So you just shook your head. Yes. Okay. Is, we're going to see I mean, some rotation minutes on like, Friday. Th- we've not got the injury report yet. So there's, there's some chance that Nick Richards and or Mark Williams could be back by Friday because they, uh, they went and trained with the G League team this week. So that means they're probably close. If they are not back, then Taj Gibson will play. If they are back, then Taj Gibson might get knocked out of the rotation. Uh, right now, the only healthy bigs on the Hornets roster are Musa Diabate, who's on a two-way contract, and Taj Gibson. That is it. Uh, Mark Williams, he has a foot sprain issue. Nick Richards fractured some cartilage between one of his ribs. Grant Williams has just torn his ACL and his meniscus in the last week, and he was playing a lot of center. So the Hornets are very thin in the front court right now. I don't think anyone thought Taj Gibson would actually be playing when they signed him. Uh, but yes, we have found ourselves in this situation. So I want to talk about LaMelo, but just to, to touch on the, the matchup for a second. So you're telling me there's a world where we go into this matchup on Friday and there's no Mark Williams um, and there's no, uh, there's no Nick Richards and it's Taj Gibson trying to stop Carl Anthony Towns. Absolutely. That is 100% a possibility. <laughs> so am I allowed as a Knicks fan to start thinking about barbecue chicken and the potential, like looking at shout out to our friends at bet us here in the States, uh, looking at Carl Anthony Towns overs as the potential for a, a breakout performance on Friday. Uh, p- permission granted, I would say. <laughs> uh, I-, I would say is Knicks fans should remember last year, Carl Towns had 60 plus points against the Hornets for the Wolves and then got benched by yeah. his own coach chasing stats and the Timberwolves lost right at the end of the game to a horrendous Hornets team. That and, the Hornets, and the Hornets came back from like 20 down in that yes, game. Yes, they, right? yeah, they did. Yeah. So maybe Carl Towns might have a little bit of revenge out there or maybe he's a little bit haunted by that. If if I can if I remember that game correctly, because I, I remember tuning in on League Pass when he had like 40 at halftime. Yeah. And I saw him stat chasing to your point, but wasn't that also like like Terry Rozier had a great game? And that was like the game that the Heat were like, that's it. We're making the deal. We're we're pulling the trigger. I see what Terry Rozier can do. That was right before he got yeah. traded, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, I am hoping that if Carl Anthony Towns goes for 60, that the Knicks don't let him stat chase and uh the the we want to talk about adults in the room, the leaders on this team uh, are more disciplined in that sense. But we'll see what happens on Friday. And I, I do I have some questions about the matchup, which we'll get to in a second, but I want to talk about LaMelo. Because I have a confession to make to you, my friend. Mm. And then we have a Patreon podcast that we do here at Next Film School, where that's the opportunity we use to talk about the rest of the league. And we, it's only been like 14, 15, some teams closer to 20 games so far. But we wanted to do like a quarter of the season all star candidates and just discuss where, where the lay of the land was. And maybe four or five games ago, this was, I said, you know what? Lamelo's stats are nice, but it, it, it's he's not super efficient. It's it's really like not even good stats, bad team. It's just a lot of stats, bad team. He's not an all star for me. And I'm, I wonder if Lamelo watched that or listened to that pod because since then there's a fifty piece in there. There's a forty four point game from him, and the efficiency has gone through the roof. Now he is taking a ton of threes, over almost twelve and a half threes a game this season. But the effective field goal percentage is back to league average is about 54 and a half. And again, 
I understand counting stats aren't the end all be all, but you average 31, five and six. You're probably an all star. Just what have you seen from his game so far this year? Is it just like an influx in three pointers, the freedom under Charles Lee to just do, do basically operate the offense in that way? Um, like what, what have you seen from him so far this year? I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to back here, Andrew. I mean, uh, firstly, you say like box you know, score numbers, counting stats don't mean everything, but you go look at the advanced stats, like offensive EPM, Lamella Ball, I want to say is like top four in the league as well. So it's not just the, you go look at the advanced analytics, like he is doing some pretty impressive things offensively as well. Look, I think the main difference here is he is fully healthy. And for two years, people have not seen a fully healthy Lamella Ball. Even when he's played, you can look at his numbers from the last two years. But he was playing with like stabilizers on because he did not have confidence in his ankle. And you look at some of the moves that he's pulling off this year and you can see that if you're playing on an ankle that is not 100%, it is going to be hard for him to get and, and to move just the way that he does because he's not athletic vertically, but he's so agile and kind of like springy from side to side. And, you know, we've seen the, the one-legged threes that he's hitting. Well, that one leg isn't planting very well, which he said it wasn't last year, that's going to affect him. So I think that's the big thing. Look, his usage rate has skyrocketed. And in line with that, his usage, his efficiency has actually gone up. And if you look yeah. at some of the difficulty of the shots he's taking, it's, it's incredible. You said his league average offense. I mean, you look at the usage and the shots he's taking, that's pretty incredible. Like this is, and this is not someone who has a lot of talent around him at right now. I actually think when this team is fully healthy with Brandon Miller, Mark Williams, Miles Bridges, like around him, I, I think there is talent there. I don't think you can just say, oh, he's got no help. But he's he's not played with all of those guys once this season. He's, as more and more people have got hurt, he's had to lean into his own offense more and more. And I definitely think Charles Lee's system has helped him. You know, it's his system is dependent on creating open threes. And it really looks at trying to get him mismatches on the perimeter. And it leans into LaMelo ball strengths. Um, and I think that's been something that's really helped LaMelo. He's definitely got a freer leash, I would say, than under Steve Clifford. Like Steve Clifford used to be pestering him. Get to the paint, paint touches, kick out. Charles Lee is not the same way inclined Steve Clifford to determine the paint touches and the Hornets are like a low passing offense right now, they, they don't pass the ball a lot. It's a lot of mismatch hunting a little bit like the Celtics do on the perimeter and you get a mismatch. You like dribble hand off action, Viz, go screens and Lamella ball is just really excelled in that. He's getting to the pop paint a lot less, but he's doing a lot of his damage from beyond the arc. And he's also mastered the slow down runner. Like we see this a lot from the unathletic players in the NBA where instead of jumping over people or through people, they find this way to kind of do this super slow step and then put up this little floater. And I think it was like 45 or 55%. I can't remember which on, on runners this year, which is just like a crazy number considering, you know, how contested they are and, and the volume that he's taking. So I would say it really is a little bit of everything. Getting to the free throw line, a system that suits him, having a, a better offensive leash. Um, I think all those things have gone into having this, you know, pretty incredible breakout year with very little help surrounding him. So I want to clarify what I meant by league average real quick. Cause I, he's, you were nailed it on usage. First of all, he's a 40.8 is usage percentage, uh, usage rate this so far this season, which is the 100 percentile in, yeah. uh, cleaning the glass. When I made said asinine take that he's not an all-star, uh, he was around 50 in points per shot attempts, uh, 50th percentile. I should say he is now back up to 71, uh, 71st percentile at 115.8 points per shot attempt, which look at, at, at as he, his efficiency continues to go up and you bring up EPM, like a, he's fourth in an offensive EPM shout out yeah, to Jalen Brunson, who is second at yeah. the moment. Um, I, it, it's just been impressive. And that's why I'm, most intrigued by on Friday because the Knicks just haven't had a solid point of attack defense all year. You know, Adam Noby is his strength is really is a roamer, but Mikael Bridges is pointed to to be this this point of attack uh, defender that that's that first line of defense. Now, then them not emphasizing paint touches and and maybe potentially hunting mismatches in the in the Charles Lee era. Uh, the thing that that stands out when I look at the Hornets like shot profile across the board is 
second and three point attempts. It's just that they're getting them up. And if you've looked at how the Knicks have lost games this year, one of the key contributors is when teams hit threes, that's for sure. But it's also when just if the Knicks offense goes cold, they don't really have a secondary gear where they can stop the other team defensively. So as we talk about this matchup, like when when it's looked the best for the Hornets, like when when they've won games, like what does it look like? Yeah, see, so you talked about the three point shooting there. <clears throat> they have to have a good three point shooting night. And the other thing is offensive rebounding. Uh, the Hornets have, whenever they've won games, they've had big offensive rebounding nights and they've also kept their turnovers down. So they've essentially won the possession battle against the team. Now, <clears throat> I think that could be more difficult to do, especially with just such little size left. But And, and the, even like missing guys like Trey Mann, Miles Bridges, who've been good on the offensive glass this year, um, it appears that we think they're going to be out still for this next game. Um, but yeah, offensive rebounding, turnovers, three-point shooting, those are the key variables. If the Knicks are able to shut down one or even two of those areas, that they will almost certainly be able to throttle this team because they just don't have a diverse enough set of, of skilled guys to, to be able to overcome many of the ways right now. And that offensive rebounding ability, does that mostly come from Williams and Richards being there? So if they're not there, does that just take a significant hit? And it's mostly going to be like if they can hit a ton of threes, they have a chance? Well, Williams hasn't played a game this year and they've been oh, successful at see, it. Un- uneducated Knicks fan here. I didn't realize that. That's that. fine. Okay. This is what we're here for, right? right. Uh, Nick Richards has been injured for half the season and he was a big part of the offensive glass. He absolutely was, but they've actually, been, and they've taken a bit of a hit, but it's still a philosophy that they have, but it's really throughout the team. Like Trey Mann, Brandon Millie's had an, an offensive rebound put back this year for a win against the Pistons. Um, it really is across the team. Musa Diabate is a, gay, is a guy who you're, you're, Fans probably won't know. Go look at Musa Diabati's rebounds per game over the last five games, and you'll be pretty shocked. He has been one of their best rebounders in the NBA over the last two weeks, playing major minutes here because of the injuries. So he's another guy who the the Knicks are going to have to keep off the glass because he's averaging, I want to say, between three and five offensive rebounds per game. Um, And he's not a guy who's really even hit an NBA rotation before. Um, But just, just on the turnovers as well, Mm. I think the last game they played the the against the Magic, the Hornets had 27 turnovers. And, you know, that is a very large number. And I think a, a good majority of those were from Lamelo Ball and Brandon Miller. And Brandon Miller is not a guy that we've talked about too much yet. Had an injury again to start the year and he's been working his way back. But he's been playing much better of late. But if you can shut down Ball and Miller and not let them get, you know, above 50, the Knicks should be fine. Because they don't have Trey Mann. They don't have Miles Bridges. They're the two of the big scorers. They're, they're, they're basically their third and fourth option behind those two. And they're missing those guys. Not even to mention the lack of size that I've already talked about. So I just want to back you up here on Musa Diabate and his yeah. offensive rebounding as late, as of late. Uh, first of all, it looks like since that that put back where they beat the, the Pistons, um, uh, beginning of November. Uh, that's when uh, Moose's minutes went up. He's been playing around 25 to 28 minutes. or In fact, the last three games, he's played 30 minutes uh, a game. But uh, the last couple games, uh, three offensive rebounds against Orlando, seven offensive rebounds against Milwaukee, seven more offensive rebounds yeah. against Detroit. A uh, couple games earlier, 10 offensive rebounds against Milwaukee. Uh, so they've they've and he's six ten. He's not yeah, even big. He's six yeah. ten, but he has an incredible motor. He's incredibly in great condition to like attack the glass. He reads the ball well off the glass, and he plays with an absolute monster physical edge. Um, so you know, he's one of those. If you come in like sleeping, trying to sleep through a game, like Musa Diabati will take advantage and make you look silly. He might airball two free throws, which <laughs> has happened this year. But he's going to grab a heck load of offensive rebounds. And what happens from those rebounds? He kicks them out to Brandon Miller, the Mellow Ball for open threes. And that's where they get some of their, their best percentage looks is off these offensive rebounds because of these relocation threes. Again, it just leans into this team's strength, which is their three-point shooting with their backcourt of Miller and Ball. What type of defense do you think they'll they'll play against the Knicks? Are they are they a team that switches? Do they play a little bit of drop? Do you think they play a little zone? Like What, what can Knicks fans expect on the defensive side of the ball? 
they 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 mix it up depending who's in the game. I think they will probably they'll play drop with Taj if he's in there. They will switch if they're playing with Salon and probably Diabate, um, especially if Towns is in the game because of a stretch five ability. Um, so I think they will mix it up in the game based on what personnel they've got available. I think ideally they would play drop is what they yeah. want to do, um, but they they're having to kind of make it up on the fly here. Which which makes sense with with so many injuries. Which oh, yeah. look, that's that's honestly a testament to good coaching if you can switch your coverages mid game. Um, I don't know how you've felt about Charles Lee so far, but if you want to just give a quick assessment through the first uh, seventeen games of of the Charles Lee experience, what would it be? He's an incredibly positive coach, which is different to Steve Clifford. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who used to go on these post game rants, like complaining about his own team. Uh, I mean, his yeah, incredibly positive. Brings a lot of positive energy that the players seem to take too well. Um, I think the the fan base's view is mixed at the moment. A lot of people didn't like him benching Lamelo Ball in the Brooklyn Nets game, uh, which is a few weeks ago. Look, how did Lamelo bounce back from that? He had a fifty piece and a forty piece. So I it's safe to say, you know, if he was looking to get a reaction out Lamelo, it worked. So m- maybe that we should judge that off of how it's worked out in the end, rather than what happened in the situation at the time. Um, he definitely changes the rotations a lot, but some of that's been forced by injury. So it's like, is he someone who does change up the rotations every night or is he having to do that? I, I think big picture, it's been like, if you're going to grade it, I would say a, a B so far. There's not been any massive red flags. I think he's been able to put ball in a position where he's excelled. Brandon Miller has had a slower start. Um, and there was some concern about his kind of change in role where he's kind of almost becoming like a spot up three point threat, but I think that was more to do with him coming back from injury, and we've started to see that change recently. Um, But again, like I said at the start of the show, it's been really hard to analyze the coaching when you're at such a talent disadvantage, and when you have players in and out the lineup every night, it's just very difficult to to look at things and analyze things and and be able to compare things, look at data, look at lineups. It's, It's been so difficult. So I think it's been solid start They've been in all these games, like they've lost quite a few, but last year they'd be like 15, 20 points down by the end of the first half and you could not watch the second game. This year they've been competitive. They've, they've stayed close enough. And for me, that says a lot about him getting the players to buy in, to fight, to play every possession. And I think that's something that they've not been able to do the last two years, even when they've had a talent deficit. So I think it's been a solid start for Charles Lee. Hey, you said it's difficult to assess it. I think you did a pretty good job there of assessing the job that he's done so far. I got to say, I, I think I have a good idea of how things have gone in Charlotte so far this year. And look, if, if at the end of the day, the, the takeaway is that look at what LaMelo is under him and the leap he might be taking. That's, that's mm-hmm. a testament so far of putting your, your best player in the position to look his best and be his best. So we'll see if that continues. Last question before you get out of here. The Knicks had a very busy offseason and potentially launched themselves into consent to contender status. Uh, your thoughts on what the Knicks did with re- re- redoing, shuffling up, you know, remaking their roster into this offensive juggernaut under Tom Thibodeau? Yeah, I always thought they'd have a slow start to the year because of so much change. Um, Look, the fact the offense looks this good with such amount of change is pretty incredible. I'm pretty certain the defense is going to improve under Thibodeau. Like, and I think as they gel more with the defensive talent they've got. So for me, I think the Knicks are absolutely a contender. I think some of the moves they made were, were brave. I think ambitious. Um, we never know if these things will like play out. Hindsight's always easy to say, oh, they shouldn't have done Randall and DiVincenzo. But I, I don't know how Randall was going to fit into this situation. Always seemed a little bit strange to me, a bit awkward that it was going to be something that lingered over this Knicks team over the season. And, and they've kind of got rid of that distraction now. And they can kind of really, not that he was a distraction, but the distraction of like his role and his usage. Right. Um, and now they can focus on how do we get this group of players? What schemes do we need to use? And I think they can use the regular season to experiment a little bit. So uh, look, I'm a big fan of this Knicks team. I think it's great. The Knicks are relevant. I think they've got a really interesting group of players. Thank you. I, I, I think they're interesting too. I would love it if I'm looking forward to that, that win streak that eventually comes. They just won four in a row. Uh, and look the, again, the first world problems of Knicks fans where like you're looking at a team that's 10 and seven with the best offense in the NBA 
and then you 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 look elsewhere and there there are other teams struggling like the Knicks haven't lost back to back they've only lost back to back games once so far this year they're 6 in 1 in games after a loss so far this year so you know we'll see what happens in the in the Dallas game and then obviously the Charlotte game too i have i have one last question for you yeah go ahead you have to tell Hornets fans about Daquan Jeffries, the mystery man, because he was sent to Charlotte as part of this trade. Everyone thought he was going to get waived. He then uh-huh. plays one preseason game, broke his finger, but stayed on the team. So he's just this guy that no Hornets fan know who he is, what he plays like. Is he worth a roster spot? Why did they keep him? Um, can, can you tell, like, if Daquan Jeffries is healthy, is he an NBA player? I, I wouldn't go that far. I think... Okay. So my theory on guys like uh, the, like Daquan Jeffries, um, like Dwayne Washington, who the Knicks also traded in that, yes. that deal to Washington and then uh, to, to Charlotte, I should say, and then had that game where he missed those free throws at the end and then got bought yes. out and sent back to his team overseas. <laughs> uh, and uh, they had this guy, uh, uh, Diakite, on the team last year. Uh, I have a theory that the Knicks just have some really good practice players that... Are, are, can can give it to you and play the right roles in practice, but then don't necessarily um, find their way into NBA rotations. Like the Ryan Archdiakonos, the Jacob Toppins of the world. Um, that like, like These aren't rookies that you're hoping to develop. They're just like kind of there. So, I mean, look, Daquan Jeffries could surprise me and make the Charlotte rotation. And when, if, if the Hornets have some type of fire sale at the end of the year, um, he plays and looks good and is a bit of a tank commander, but I didn't, I didn't look at when the Knicks traded him to Charlotte as like, Oh no, we let, we had to give up the da- Daquan Jeffries in the deal. If that makes any sense with, with as much respect to Daquan Jeffries, who has achieved more athletically than either of us ever will. I don't necessarily think he finds his way into an NBA rotation. No, right? it's just bizarre. Everyone expected him to be waived like Charlie Brown and Dwayne Washington. And he just stayed in the team with a broken hand. And it's like, why are they doing this? But uh, yeah. Anyway, Al- alternative options could also determine that. Like they just didn't have another a better option for for that. Which I mean, you mentioned they're they're pretty banged up at the moment, so maybe they they could have gone, well, exactly. gone a different way. <laughs> so who knows? Uh, but uh, look, I look forward to touching base with you later in the season if he's cracked the rotation uh, and being like, hey, tell me about the Daquan Jeffries experience if there is one, which I, I think might also determine what the Hornets record is at the moment. If there is uh, a Daquan Jeffries experience, Uh, James, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Um, Before you get out of here, please let the fine folks at home know where they can find you and all the work that you do. Yeah, you can find me on X and on Blue Sky at British underscore Buzz. Uh, You can also find my work on Hornets on SI and also on the Hornets on SI podcast as well. How do you pronounce your last name, by the way? Plow right. I did say it right. Okay, you good. Yeah, you Make nailed it. it. Sure. Make it sure. I didn't know if it was plow right or plow right. I now you got it. That's the thing where I, I'm sure I, you you know this, but like you want to know that before you go live on air, and then you have that minor anxiety when you don't check, and you're about to like like introduce the person. Like I hope I say their you name. Mu- you right. must have it too, though, Claudio, Claudio. Do you not Cloud- get that sometimes? I do get that sometimes. Yeah. I do get that sometimes. But I, I think that the Hispanic ver- pronoun- pronunciation of my name is Claudio. So. Like I'm used to it. Like I've been, I've been being called Claudio by every Titi and, and Theo in my life for the majority of my life. So uh, it's, it's not like it's an incorrect pronunciation. Uh, my friend, thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Knicks Film School Pregame Pod. And thank you everybody for tuning in to another edition of the Pregame Pod. We do this before every Knicks game. I will be back on Sunday to preview the Knicks matchup against the Pelicans. If you dug this episode, head over to iTunes, drop a five-star rating and a review. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video. Remember to subscribe. Until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the game today, and I will speak with you soon.